So, uh, there's so much to say, and maybe just to start a little bit. So, my understanding of what we were last time is that last time I wanted to focus really on the Second World War to the Second Vatican Council, and what I what I what I brought out, what I was trying to bring out was some of the experiences. I, I think a little bit what we're what I'm what I'm trying to do, thinking through the life and work of Ratzinger, is always trying to get to what might be some. What might be be the uh, the sources of some of his uh, assumptions? Not that assumptions are bad, but that there could be. And a lot of times, the sources of our assumptions come from our life, <laughs> right? And then also, while, while appreciating the achievement of what he tried to carry out, I also want to start to look at, well, what might be some limitations of what he tried to carry out? And a lot of, a lot of the things that he himself tried to carry out were the fruit of his also life experiences as much as it was theology. And he even comments on that in, the, in his address to the Roman Curia. That we're gonna, I'm gonna use that a little bit as the template for the discussions, of for our discussions on the Second Vatican Council and then on what on what kind of his own papacy. <clears throat> I think in his, especially in his papacy and after his papacy. And he, but even now, I think before the council, right? And, and this even comes out in Space Salvi. It comes out in his commentaries on, in. And almost everything, whenever anybody writes him a letter asking to reflect on his papacy in his posthumous writings, for example, there's this interplay in his thought between what happened after the French Revolution until the First World War, right? And then what happened after the Second World War? And then what happened after the Council? It's like the, his, his, his mind is always going between these three experiences, you know, eval evaluating them and then trying also to come up with a new statement of some sort. <clears throat> and there's a, there's a, there are, there are these three, I, I, I quoted some of them last time, but I want to go back to them just to reiterate them. It's points 88 to 90 in the catechism and then 234 to 237 in the catechism. I think these points are really interesting because, <clears throat> first of all, he helped, he, as, as, an, as like the right-hand man, let's say, to John Paul II, just to use layman's terms, he really helped to put the catechism together. And one feature of the catechism, which is, which I think he would say is a real fruit of, the sec of what he would call the authentic Second Vatican Council, is that before each section of the catechism, there's an explanatory section, you know, kind of saying, why are we, why do we deal with, why do we put the creed first, right? Or even just to saying that, why do we put the creed first? Uh, why are there four parts to the catechism, right? The creed, the moral life, the sacraments, the life of prayer. There's, and, and before each of those parts, there's an explanatory session or explanatory segment. Also, why is the catechism not in a question and answer format? Right, that also has to come to, that comes down to a kind of pedagogical decision, right? That, that the, cate the catechisms before the Second Vatican Council, many of them were Q&A. Many of them had almost no ref they, they, they referred to scripture, obviously, and they came out of scripture and they came out of tradition, but there were no footnotes, right? There was no way to find that out. Whereas now, like in the current catechism, you have one book, which is the Catechism, then you have another book, which is all the, all the footnotes, <laughs> all the sources that are footnoted in the Catechism. And again, not, uh, <clears throat> so in this explanatory sec section, 88 to 90, for example, he's explaining the, I say he, this, this language, it almost comes out of the work of Matthias Sheban. It's, it's almost word for word out of the work of Matthias Schieben, who was this 19th century Catholic German theologian, who himself was trying to reconcile the, the polarities, you might say, between the, the neo-Thomists that had arisen in the 19th century on the one hand, and the deep-seated 
going even back to the pre-French Revolution, Rousseauian naturalists on the other hand, right? And Sheban himself was trying to bring about a kind of synthesis uh, between these, these different factions in Germany and in Europe in the 1860s, 1870s. <clears throat> and, and, and so uh, the, the point 88, the magisterium, when it's exercising its authority, it, it's holding Christ to the full ex extent. This is, a, this is uh, Pope Benedict will come, he'll, he'll make this point and he'll remake this point time and again. He makes it in Space Salvi, right, that Christ has to be the beginning of our, you know, our faith is based on a person, Christ. And Christ has to be the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega of our life and also of our thought. And so, so but Christ, and what, so when the magisterium is exercising its authority, it's holding Christ to the fullest extent as it defines dogmas. <clears throat> and I think you could almost interchange dogma with principle, or you could at least say they're very close. Okay? Defining dogmas. When it, when it defines dogma, what is it doing? It's obliging the people that you, you have to hold to this faith in an irrevocable way, right, without going back on it. And then also proposing the truths which are in Revelation and everything that has a necessary connection with these truths. Right? So <clears throat> then the next point, I think, also this, this comes out of Sheban. There, this is 89 in the Catechism. There's an organic connection between our spiritual life and the dogmas. <clears throat> and this, you can see this ordering of his mind in the 2005 address to the Curia. And this is also responding to a tendency which you see emerging in the 50s, 60s, 70s in that, that I think both John Paul II and Benedict are trying to respond, they're, they're responding to this tendency in the way they carry out their pontificates. So there's an organic connection between our spiritual life and the dogmas. A shorthand way, something you could say is that life comes before, life comes before the dogmas even. When I was 18 and I was studying, I, I started reading Etienne Gilson's The Autobiography of a Philosopher. It's a great little book. <clears throat> and I was talking with my professor about this, this book, and the professor just said to me very, very succinctly, he said, it's better to live the truth. What kind of one of the things Gilson is getting at in this book, Etienne Gilson was a neo-scholastic Thomist, right of the of the late twentieth century, mid 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 to late twentieth century. But anyway, one of the things that uh, this professor was getting at is that it's important to live the truth before you speak the truth. Right? Obviously, the two are connected. That we we can't create a dichotomy between the two, but. <clears throat> So there's a connection between our spiritual life and the dogmas. Dogmas are lights along the path of faith. I am the way, the truth, and the light. <laughs> right? So dogmas are lights on the path of faith. They illuminate it and they make it secure. Conversely, if our life is upright, our intellect and heart will be open to welcome the light shed by the dogmas of faith. Right? So the more... We live an upright life. <clears throat> the more our intellect and heart are open to the mysteries of the faith, the highest mystery, which he'll define in 234, the central mystery of the Christian faith is the Blessed Trinity. Right? So the more, the more we live the life based on faith, the more we receive lights to... And this is, this is important for theology because when theology, we're trying to start with revelation and make further insights into the mysteries of the faith, guide, which can be obscure and difficult, obviously, guided by the magisterium, in order to further understand what are the necessary things that connect with the dogmas. Right? That's, that's kind of a tough, I mean, understood properly, it's a kind of serious challenge. When, uh, this, when, I, was, when I was a professor before I was a priest, 
So I, I, ta I oftentimes taught freshmen. And so I taught them philo intro to introduction to philosophy. And uh, I had a number of students that their career at Notre Dame was they would take my class and then they would become philosophy and theology majors. <laughs> and then for their, for their, uh, you know, for their student uh, job, you know, because you, you, you have a job as a student, make a little extra money. The student job was always, a lot of them would, would gravitate towards becoming the student workers in the theology department. <clears throat> and I had several students, the same thing happened to them. There was this one, there was this one professor in the theology department. There'd always be a moment where they were kind of walking down the hall, like with some photocopy papers or something like that. And she would take the student and kind of throw him into a room like this one and shut the doors and say, you, I know you're a philosophy major. I know you know logic very well. I know you know Thomism very well. You have to come into theology. If you apply to the program, I will accept you. There's so many people around here. They don't know the first thing about logic and philosophy. They're terrible theologians, <laughs> right? I can't say this outside, but then she would say, I can't say this outside of the walls of this room. I will never repeat this outside of the walls of this room, <laughs> right? But please come and I will fight for you. I will defend you. And then, and then she would walk away like she didn't know them, you know? <laughs> but, but that's, uh, I think it's a good example of, uh, of, of theology, <laughs> right? We're looking into mysteries, but we do need help, right? We need, we need a certain logic, a certain rigor. And we also need the help of the magisterium. And one of the things that, that Pope Benedict says in his biography, in his, in his interviews, is he says, he says, when I was doing theology in the 50s, Again, we were all trying, we all thought, he said, I thought what we were all doing was trying to understand further these mysteries and how to apply them. But then in 1968, it became clear to me that there were a number of individuals that that's not what they were doing, right? They were trying to fundamentally change the dogmas or the principles. And so that's, I think, and that, and that, and you can say that, that dynamic, it's, well, it's, it's, it's very much wrapped up in his address that he gives to the Curia in 2005. So I just want to also, since, but I, I think these points in the catechism, they're, they're good framing points for us, for, uh, for, for our discussions. I, are, there any, are there any questions <clears throat> on what I've said? So can I pause this and then restart it? Uh, here. Mm -hmm. If anyone would like to get some pizza, yeah, okay, so this might be a good opportunity to get some pizza. <laughs> some, if people aren't going to be the first, I'll certainly do that first. Yes, yes. Sorry, I thought yes. No, it's only okay. okay. We, yeah. I, I, I started it, didn't I? Oh, there's also coffee in there. I thought I started it. Oh, you, you did. You oh, okay. Did. Yeah. Just, just hit that one. Next time. Story. Yeah. <clears throat> Father Jeff, maybe you spoke about this in the first session. Uh, is it okay? To ask yeah, 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 yeah. But the, the um, <clears throat> yeah, so Ratzinger in 68 realized that something he didn't realize before in the early 60s. Did you give an account of what, of what these counter forces were? Did you talk a little bit about? Yeah, so. Uh, who would want to change principles, in other words? Right, the right. So. <clears throat> I guess we could we could di I, I was going to dive into that more today. Okay, yeah, yeah, no but problem. we could we could dive into that right now. Whatever. Yeah. So, so basically, let, let me uh, well let me let me introduce the the two thousand five. Uh, yeah, yeah. So so what I'm what I'm going to do now that I'm going I think I'm going to answer this question or I'm going to I'm going to start to answer this question and what I've prepared. So, now what I'd like to do then is. I'd like to turn to the, the 2005 address to the Roman Curia as, our, as just the text for reflecting on, on the one hand, <clears throat> the 19th century, the, the debates that arose in the 19th century in the Catholic world after the French Revolution. On the other hand, what happens after the Second World War on the other hand, what happens in the Second Vatican Council, right? So we might be flowing back and forth between those three moments, just as he does. I, I, I started okay. it, yeah. So first of all, 
there, there are some things, if you'd like to kind of get a sense, if you want to get a sense of, like, what is the, what's on the mind of the Pope? What's he trying to do as far as developing theology? One place to start is his addresses to the Roman Curia. Again, these are not magisterial in the sense of an encyclical, right? I mean, there, there, there's different documents that can come out of the Vatican that have different, they have, they have different degrees of seriousness or importance as far as what we would say is the magisterium of the church. So just to give a few examples, right? An interview on an airplane, that's just, that's, that has almost zero, from, from, one, from zero to 100, that has like 10, <laughs> as far as magisterial value. Why? Because what's the Pope doing there? He's trying to teach, right? So he's trying to just take what he knows, he's trying to meet the audience where they are, just like, just like a professor might, or a teacher might, or a shepherd might. A shepherd would be the better ter term. Uh, the, the, ho the, uh, the homilies he gives at masses or the addresses on sa Sunday or Wednesday in the Vatican. Again, those would, a lot of times popes will use those as exercising his just capacity as a theologian and a pastor. How do I teach the people? How do I explain the mysteries? For example, mu much of what we now call Pope John Paul II's Theology of the Body comes out of Wednesday audiences that he gave in St. Peter's Square. And again, that, again, that doesn't have high, like that's not high, high, high value as far as magisterium of the church. As far as like permanent, inf like what we're talking about here, the central mysteries of the faith. It's more applying the central mysteries of the faith to circumstances. You could, you, now, nowadays we have these uh, post-synod exhortations or apostolic exhortations. Again, those are, they're mostly, they're not, they're not usually, he's not trying to explain an insight into some dogmatic truth of the faith as he is trying to say, well, how do we, this area of life, the family, right? The Eucharist, right? What is the synod said about how we can live this better or how we can pay better attention to the family? Again, not high, we're not talking about dogma here. Encyclicals, on the other hand, usually is where the Pope will try to take a dogma and f give further insight into it, and then maybe also apply it in some, in some significant way. <clears throat> so, and oftentimes, I, I think there can, be a mis, there can be a misunderstanding of you know, there are people who are like, they get caught up in an, they have some sort of cause that's their cause. And they can go to, for example, an apostolic exhortation and they can say, see the Pope, the Pope in this apostolic exhortation, he's saying this about the family and therefore there's a development of doctrine. And it's like, whoa, horsey, right? <laughs> no, no, it's, it's not a development of doctrine. In fact, oftentimes the Popes know, and he, they can even do this in encyclicals. There's way they, there's, there are ways that they can signal this, like, what I'm doing here is theological speculation, and I encourage you, the reader, also to see if you can continue in this line of theological speculation. Again, not that it's, it's not, spe speculation here is not something irrelevant, but it's just, well, how could we flesh this out more? <clears throat> and so one example of this also is, and I think an example of this that you can, you see is the whole development of moral ecology, right, as a kind of platform for, for thinking about the moral life. There are papal statements that go back to the 1970s on where, where they're basically trying to, they're, they're asking the question, is there some sort of holistic way we can approach morality, not denying any principles, right? Not undermining any principles, but can we speak about morality using a language that, that could be accessible to modern man, however you define modern man? And, and whatever group you think is representative of modern man, that's another uh, two, two questions worth a answering at some point. But is there a way we can, re you might say, recast morality using this language of ecology or the environment that will help bring people once again to appreciate all the principles of morality? <clears throat> and there, there's a, there was a famous moment in the first year or second year of his papacy where Benedict was speaking to the Swiss bishops. 
and he, they forgot his notes. So when they forgot his notes, he then just gave an extemporaneous speech on moral ecology. And where he basically, he basically said what I just said, right? You know, Pope John Paul II, after he, you know, he said something to the effect of after the Cold War ends, we began to think, we began to think, especially in the late 90s, is there a way that the church could address the Western, especially thinking now more of the West as opposed to the East, could we address the West in this, in a little bit more of a holistic, moral way, looking at all, looking at all, like e economy, you know, usury, like all these tough questions, but in the context of moral ecology. And, and Benedict was saying to the Swiss bishops, maybe the way you guys could do this would be through moral ecology. So Benedict was also saying to the Swiss bishops, maybe there's a theology that could be developed here. And then you can see, obviously, Pope Francis seizes on this and tries to continue it in, in a way, right? Again, not denying any principles, but seeing is there kind of a holistic way we can approach the environment that could be accessible to many people and be also be evangelistic, right? Draw them into the faith more as well. Now, but again, this doesn't mean, this doesn't mean that this is a new proposal of, of uh, this is not a development of doctrine even. It's, it's a pedagogical approach in many cases. Yes. But Father, could we say the same also about, because the hot button issue at the moment, um, there are lots of hot button issues. I mean, I yeah, 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 yeah. Some of them, but uh, like Amoris Letizia, which is also, of course, an encyclical, even the sort of, uh, you know, Pius XII, a lot of the things that new <laughs> Thomas will quote is that only Thomism must be taught because Pius XII. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is your hobby horse. Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> 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 No, so we're, we're going to get to this. We're going to get to this. Yeah, we're going to get to this. So, so, so now, so at the same time, the Roman Curia, the Roman Curia, when he addresses the Roman Curia, it's always very interesting to read the addresses to the Roman Curia. But you got you got to read them. You know, they're 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 subtle. They're subtle documents. But this is the Pope speaking to everyone who works with him in the Vatican, right? And all of the offices in the Vatican, they're precisely there to help the Pope communicate communicate his message and you know to communicate a kind of life to the church so when he's addressing the roman curia this is one of the few times in the year where he has everybody there and he can say to everybody what's on his mind <clears throat> so these, these are just if i don't know if you want to become a vaticanista <laughs> right Follow the follow the addresses of the Roman Curia. They're always very they're always very interesting, and it, they they they're insightful also about. Usually, when he addresses the Roman Curia, he's willing to say a little bit more like what's on his mind, what he hopes to do next. You know, the idea is that he hopes that somehow find a substantive outlet somewhere, and that will find it. So, for example, in this address, he'll speak about the French Revolution, the American Revolution. And this will become part of the theme of Space Salvi, right? Like, what is living hope versus what does it mean to be a revolutionary? And I think that's also very interesting to, to understand at some point. So in this, in this document, or in this speech to the Roman Curia, I'm, I'm going to kind of just summarize the first part of it. But, but in the first part of it, he's... So, again, coming out of the Second Vatican Council... There was a lot of theology, there was a lot, especially in missionary work, that was done, basically saying, forget about so-called evangelization, right? Like if you're doing something in Latin America or Africa or Asia, right? Don't evangelize, right? Don't, don't preach the gospel. Just give witness, right? Just give witness and, just, and then help people out as you can. <clears throat> So I, I one time was I did a service project to a, a coastal town in Ecuador, and this nun was there. This nun was the last nun in this little order there, helping this little town, and she she didn't she wasn't a, she just lived. I mean, she joined her religious order in the early seventies, and she was just a good lady, and she just lived what they told her to live, and she told when we first got there, and the town was really uh, the town was in a kind of crisis in the sense that. The, at some point, the evangelicals or the Pentecostals came in. And it's really interesting, in the early 70s, when a lot of the religious orders were basically saying, we're just going to give witness. We're not going to talk about Christ. We're just going to give witness. 
the evangelical churches had their councils, and they basically said the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to speak about Christ, right? We're going to go to all these countries and speak about Christ, yeah. Yeah. right? And then, and then we'll see what happens as far as other things as well. And so that's actually had, that, that literally was what we saw in this village. About a third of the village had joined the evangelical church. And then the rest of the village had uh, <clears throat> remained Catholic, but they, again, there was a very, there were, they didn't really know. They, they, it was more of a, it was more, it was more cultural. I mean, they couldn't, they couldn't explain anything about their faith. And that's, and then the priest, the priest who had just come in, he had, now, the, but the priest who had just, it was interesting, the other dynamic here was that the priest who had just come in, the, and this is part of, I think, this will get it, this is part of this address also. He was one of the first priests trained in the diocese, in the diocesan seminary that the bishop had set up in the 90s. So in the 90s, the bishop basically said, well, we have to set up a, a seminary for the people of Ecuador, right? So we, we want to train our priests from the people of Ecuador. And it was kind of inspired by John Paul II, right? In a much different way than maybe the, 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 the people of the 70s or these theologians of the 70s had imagined. So, but the idea of giving witness, so it's interesting, like, so this, and this is part of what, Benedict is always doing this. He's always, there's always a little subtle message he's sending. And, he, and this is part of also understanding the Vatican because it is a European I mean, I think for Americans, this can sometimes be more difficult to appreciate. It is European. There are still aristocratic manners that prevail in a way that maybe Americans aren't used to. I mean, read Mark Twain's Innocence Abroad if you want to like start understand a little bit of this dynamic. <laughs> but but no, because a lot of times, and I was there was I, again, I, I knew this official in the State Department when I was living in Rome, and he said to me. Whenever you read things from the Vatican, you always have to, it's, it's helpful to basically, if you can, to appreciate, there's usually an understanding that the Vatican has of things that they're not saying. <clears throat> and everything they're saying, if you understand the logic of it, it points to, it points to what, they, what they're really trying to get at. So, uh, and, and Benedict, again, having been raised in Germany <laughs> and then spent most of his life in the Vatican. This is very much his culture, right? So I, I don't say this to condemn it or to praise it. I just say that's the way it is, right? To understand it. I think all governments to some degree also do this, right? This is not unusual, right? If you, if you, every government, when there's a diplomatic exchange between two, two governments, they always do a readout, right? And the readout always includes some things, but not everything, <laughs> So a lot of times it's interesting. You, re you read the readouts from two different governments and you get a fuller picture of what might have gone on in the meeting, right? So it's, this is not earth-shattering you know, research. But, but so one of the things that he does here in this, in this, again, this is the first year of his pontificate, is that he speaks about the witness of John Paul II, right? So go, this is very much hearkening back to this... But, but of course, and what does he bring out? He brings out, well, the witness of John Paul II teaches us the importance of preaching Christ, right? So, so he's, he's a little bit trying to turn on, turn on its head or turn the tables on those. And he knows that there's many people who are listening to him who oversee missionary activity because they're working for the Roman Curia, right? And there is... Again, there's all again in, in in the Vatican, and there's always people who give even well, you know, well-meaning people, let alone maybe unscrupulous people. But there are well-meaning people that do have real disagreements about emphasis. What do you emphasize, right? How do you lead? You know, what do you put your chin out for, <laughs> right? How do you lead? So he precisely, like, it's interesting. So he precisely presents the life and the witness of John Paul II as doing what? As leading us to Jesus Christ, as, as being important, suffering. Jesus Christ comes to suffer on the cross. Okay, so the meaning of that. And then also he speaks about, and, and this was part of the strategy of the papacy of John Paul II, of are there things we can do that <clears throat> energize the people? And again, this, goes, this is a debate that had been taking place throughout the, throughout the 20th century, right? 
again, there's a theological debate throughout the 20th century. It goes back to the 19th century. It goes back to La Monet of the 1820s and 1830s, right? Where do you see, it's, it's a little bit Hegelian, like where do you see the vital spirit manifesting itself, right? And the vital, how do you know the vital spirit is there? There's, there's energy, there's enthusiasm. And again, <clears throat> Lamanet in the 1820s and 1830s, he was arguing, well, the vital spirit are, is in those who are promoting democracy. And so the church should embrace full, wholeheartedly democracy, right? Going back to the 1820s and 1830s. In the, in, the, in the 1920s and 1930s, there were a lot of Catholic theologians who were arguing that you see the vital spirit in men like Mussolini, right? No, the, no and the, these, were, these were the progressives, right, who were saying, you see in these movements the vital spirit manifesting itself. And then, obviously, by the, by the end of the Second World War, the vital spirit had changed. It had moved. And the vital spirit had moved into Mao and Stalin, right? No, and so, so many, of these, many of the same theologians who in the 20s and 30s were seeing the vital spirit in Mussolini, in the, in the 50s and 60s, we're now seeing it in, you know, the, the, the base movements, right? The base people's movements <clears throat> in Mao, inspired by Mao, inspired by China, in Tanzania, you know, there, there's the great, there's the Julius Nerere rises up in Tanzania as a Catholic leader, inspired by Mao, right? And, but also in many Latin American countries, right? So you see this, <clears throat> so John Paul II, uh, one of the ways that he tried, again, I, I'm just saying, I think this is just what happened. There's another question of evaluating the good and the bad of this, right? But John Paul II, one of the reasons he does the World Youth Day, he starts the World Youth Days, is because he wants to basically create, <clears throat> he wants to create an experience of young people who are energetic and enthusiastic and who are fully on, fully on board with the faith, right? And it's kind of almost as a way of trying to show to the bishops and to show to the Vatican Curia and the cardinals that people want Jesus Christ, they want the sacraments, they want the faith, and they're excited about it. So I know in my own life, right, I went to like five or six World Youth Days. And uh, the last one I went to was Cologne, which, which he speaks about, right? Which he speaks about here. And I remember we were all struck. We were all struck. And he says the same thing here. We were all struck at Cologne, especially those of us who were like uh, frequent flyers to these World Youth Day events. We were all really struck at Cologne. How, how could you have like these hundreds of thousands of kids here and it was, we had silent adoration of the Blessed Sacrament for several hours that night. So it was the first World Youth Day that just wasn't craziness all night long, right? Because there are some critiques of World Youth Day, which I can appreciate, right? <clears throat> but uh, I mean, I respect, I respect some of the critiques of World Youth Day. Uh, but, and so he comments to that in the, in the address of the Roman Curia. So, but another, this is another interesting feature, right? that the, in the address to the Roman Curia, he's already sending out this subtle signal, right? Jesus Christ matters. The witness of John Paul II matters. The Eucharist matters. Confession matters. These are all the things that a lot of the people that were promoting the vital spirit in the set, by the 70s they were saying the vital spirit is going to do, we're going to do away with the sacraments. We're going to do away with all these things. This is where the vital spirit is leading us, right? So he's, again, a little bit, he's kind of subtly turning, thing, turning the tables on some of the people in his audience at this moment. And it, but it's indirect. Yeah. Uh, a quick question then just on that. How, what, what sort of terminology do you think... The, uh, Pope Benedict would have used um, to articulate the spirit of what he's uh, what he sees as the um, well, you know, the spirit that should govern the church. Maybe there's an obvious answer to this, but um, yeah, as opposed to the vital spirit, right? Like this, the vital spirit seems like one that changes 
uh, you know, with the times. And right. Very, based on the people rather than, right. you, know, uh, you know, the revelation of right. Christ. So how, how, how would the, right now you've explained, uh, you know, sort of Benedict's own idea in negation. Uh, but how would you sort of articulate it in, in a positive sense? So I think the I think the you know again going back even to the 19th century you can see and he uses the term in the in the uh, in the third page of the address. There's a little term that slips in there that goes back to the 19th century that <clears throat> that both the neo scholastics and the romantics that everyone in the 19th century would use, but in a in a in a kind of non Hegelian way, and it's it's the it's the last paragraph on this third page, the paragraph that begins the experience of prayer in the church, yes. has already shown how nonsensical the, this antithesis was. Right. The, the, so in other words, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, right. and even so, the even the even the neo scholastics, and Guardini used this term. Guardini was this great theologian of the 20th century. It's really interesting. There's one, I think there's one work by Guardini, which is in, in Italian, which has never been translated into English, <laughs> which is perhaps his, his most important work for understanding, I think for understanding uh, many Catholic theologians of the 20th century, including John Paul II, including Benedict, and also including Francis. And... Uh, the title in Italian is uh, the uh, the opposition of contradictions. I think I forget how I forget the exact. That's the tra that's my literal translation, but I forget the actual Italian now. But it's something like the opposition of contradictions, and it's really interesting. It's never been translated. Of all the things that have been translated in English by Guardini, this one has not been translated into English. But basically, it's where Guardini lays out like how the 19th century Thomists approach problems. Uh, with the with the idea being is that you have a you have a thesis and then you the thesis is like what's always been taught. The but again they don't mean this in a kind of Marxist Hegelian Marxist way. What they mean it more is like how do you fruitfully, how do you fruitfully engage tradition so as to bring about <clears throat> an application of tradition to our circumstances, right? So the thesis is what's always been taught. The antithesis is something that's present in our environment that we need to account for in order to resolve the tension. And then the, the synthesis is, well, how we resolve that tension in our environment. And the, the, Thomas, the, uh, the, the Thomas of the 19th century used this as their approach for, a, for trying to deal with a lot of problems. But again, it's the Holy Spirit that guides the magisterium in this process it's not the spirit of the age I see. right or the media <laughs> right because i think a big i think a big idea i think and he'll get into this right the council of the media we always i i think actually one hypothesis this like if you want to i don't know, just images that might be helpful here it's really interesting that he's a big critic of the council of the media but in the end his when he leaves the papacy a big factor in that is the media, right? Yeah. Right. So it's just it's interesting, you know. It's interesting uh, history, how history. So then the and it, again when he when he finally says it on page four, he says the last thing the last thing I, the last event of this year what I want to reflect on is the conclusion of the the 40th anniversary of the conclusion of the Second Vatican Council. And this is the vast majority of the address, right? This is the big, this is the big issue. <clears throat> it's the big issue and, and he kind of, so it's the big issue because, well, he was part of the Second Vatican Council. And he, his whole, his whole life really, he's a young, I, I think we said this last time, at the Second Vatican Council, he's the, he's the secretary to Cardinal Frings. He essentially writes uh, Frings's intervention in November of 1962, which is the and which is the revolutionary moment of the council. And I and part of his whole life after November of 1962 is to explain that revolutionary moment. 
Like, what does it mean? <clears throat> and again, I, when I was a political philosopher, when I studied revolutions, and when I had to teach revolutions, I would always, one thing I would always say that, just for getting started, right? All, rev, all revolutions will usually break up into civil wars, right? And one of the, you know, in the case of the, just as, you know, in the case of the French Revolution, eventually you get the Girondins versus the Jacobins, right? In the case of the American Revolution, the way, the way I would always teach it is that, well, there's a, there's a tension between the North and the South, these different factions, the, the Constitution is like, a, is like an agreement that we're not going to fight each other, <laughs> but eventually the tension comes out in the Civil War, but it just, it's a delay. And the, right? and the, ten, and the you know, subsequent Civil War yeah. today. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or in the English that. Revolution, right? you, you get the Roundheads and the, Pur the Puritans and the Cavaliers, right? The Roundheads and the Cavaliers, right? So it's just a, the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks, right? The, so, it's, so you could also say if this is a, and, and one, of the, <clears throat> one of the things that he keeps addressing throughout his life including in his, inter, inter, his um, interview with Seawald, is whether November of 62, whether that was a revolutionary act or not. And it's not clear, uh, to me, this is one of those areas where there's a kind of ambiguity <laughs> that he never resolves. Mm. But, it, but I think one thing that he does say throughout is that <clears throat> he thinks, so, and part of the challenge that he's, and he'll explain this here, how do you bring about a change of emphasis? There might be a needed change of emphasis. How do you bring that about preserving the principles, right? And making it clear that you preserve the principles. And so it's just, uh, I think an image that I was thinking about, because I've done, I've done some study on, of, especially from the standpoint of the U.S., a little bit from Germany leading up to the Second Vatican Council. And so I know some things about, like for example, I think we were saying this last time, where does the whole term, the spirit of Vatican II come from? It was first used in Time Magazine. And the man who coined it was Michael Novak. <clears throat> and even at the beginning of the Second Vatican Council, uh, there's this other, uh, he was a priest, but then he left the, he left the Jesuits, Robert, Robert Blair Kaiser, right? He was one, so the, the the group the, the group of journalists that were there with Time Magazine to to try to both and it's, it's interesting. I, I think they were both there to try to influence it, but also to cover it, right? So it's <laughs> but the, but the there was uh, Michael Novak was one of them, and then Robert Blair Kaiser was the other one, and of course they were being funded by Henry Luce whose wife was Clara Booth Luce. And she was a famous like celebrity convert to Catholicism in the 1950s. And <clears throat> the Luces also were very close to the, <laughs> to C.D. Jackson, to the, to the group of politicians we now call neoconservatives. And uh, to the, also to the like, this kind of uh, the Luce, for example, Claire Booth Luce was very good friends with Alan Dulles, who was the head of the CIA. So there, was, there were all these connections to the American state. And one of the things that they did to try to influence, you, I think everyone in this group will understand this. Uh, one of the things they did to try to influence people in Rome during the time of the Vatican Council is they had socials. They had Wednesday evening socials, <laughs> but they, but they, but they weren't funded by the Divinity School at Harvard. <laughs> they were funded by 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 Luce. They were actually funded by Luce, right? Who was the publisher of Time Magazine. So I don't. And I, I just. This is like one. I don't. I don't know the answer to this question, but I just wonder. Did did Cardinal Red or did did. Did Ratzinger, the young, like a guy like Ratzinger at this point would have been younger than me. He would have been, uh, he was 17 and 47, let's say. So he would have been 40, no, 30, 30 something. Late 30s. Yeah. He would have been in his mid 30s. Did he go to these socials? No, because he spoke English. Could he have gone to these socials? You know, I know a lot of Americans went to these socials. 
but I mean, certainly that was, you know, obviously that's, and that's a little bit how Rome, I mean, obviously every, every, this is just natural human behavior, right? You go to, you go to clubs, you go to social groups, you have social groups and, but th this is another theme. Like I, I know several people that when he was at the CDF, they would bring him stuff to read, you know, commenting on American politics or whatnot. And he would say to them, <clears throat> you cannot, he said, he would say things like, I like this but it's not acceptable for polite company, right? And there is, again, I think maybe at Harvard, we, we, you know, we have this sense here more at Harvard than like where I taught at Notre Dame that like there are these social clubs, right? And how do you get, like I knew, I knew a guy once, he was a friend of mine who was at Harvard in the early 90s and I forget what social club he was trying to join, but he, he answered, they, they asked him a question about evolution and he answered, he answered it in the wrong way. And he at least felt that that, was the, that, would, that doomed him from ever getting entrance into whatever the social club was he was trying to get involved in, right? And so there is, but there is, and I think also, but the reason I bring this up is that <clears throat> even, in, even in, the, in this address, and even in the way that the whole like World Youth Day was conceived of, it's kind of almost like a way of, right? A lot of the, and even when he's addressing the curia, that part of what's going on is this, this, this discussion between the Vatican and the elites, right? In, in the 19th century, the liberals were not, the liberals were not the majority of people, right? When, like in, in France in the 19th century, whenever they expanded the franchise to 10% of the adult population, the people would vote for monarchy. <laughs> and the liberals were deeply disturbed. They were always like deeply disturbed by this, right? So what did they do? They would, they would try to limit the franchise to 2%, right? And so every time they limited the franchise to 2%, the liberals would win, right? So, and, and so a lot of, a lot of times, and, and even when Ratzinger is speaking about <clears throat> the, you know, the bitter opposition of the church to the modernists and whatnot, a lot of this is, a, it's, it's, the, it's elite discussion, right? We, we sometimes fail to appreciate, for example, both in France and in Italy, so many of the people that you'll see in the news who are cardinals or important clergymen or theologians, right? Just to give you an example. So I, I spent a summer researching in France and I was living at this residence. And at one point, there was just happened to be one day when there were no foreigners in the, in the residence except for me. And, and me and like five French guys. So literally it was kind of funny because we go into this one room and they closed it. We're in the residence by ourselves. No one else is there. And they closed the doors to the room we were in. And they say to me, look, we, we trust you. Like you understand us Frenchmen. So we're going to tell you something now that we wouldn't say to, we wouldn't, we would never say this with all the foreigners here, right? They even said, especially the Spaniards, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, anyway, <laughs> but anyway, they said, they said, you know, Jacques is a count. So and so is a duke. So and so is, you know, and they went through the, they went through the, the aristocratic titles of every Frenchman in the room. And they basically said, according to French law, we can't preserve these titles, but we do preserve them, right? We all know what everybody is. All the families from, from where we're from, they all know who everybody is. And they said, and they also then said to me, by the way, right, 90% of the priests in France still come from the aristocratic families. And all the bishops and cardinals definitely come from these aristocratic families. And they still have the sense that what they're doing is serving their nation and serving their, you know, and again, they have their, some of them, they, they have their theological disputes. Right, but they're not, they're not the common man, right? You know, and I think a little bit, like, again, we, I don't know, growing up, like whenever we, you watch movies about the priesthood in the United States, you get on the waterfront, right? The, the priest who's just like the Irish priest, who's like the common man, <laughs> fighting for the common man, and, you know, trying to get, you know, good wages for everybody. And again, the structure of, even of who becomes a priest in the United States is a little bit different than France. And so a lot of times the dialogues that are going on that you see coming out of Rome, they are, they're dialogues between elites, 
just from a, just from like a sociological standpoint. And a lot of times the dialogue, so, so, <clears throat> so it's important, I think, to just to keep that in mind. Again, I, I, I'm not. I'm just saying, just to say, this is the way it is. This is the. Di this is part of the sociological dynamic. <clears throat> and so, even when you know, even when 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 Benedict is speaking, like say, to the Swiss bishops, and saying uh, moral ecology, he's not talking about like this is how you're going to deal with the French truck driver, right? He's talking about how you can get a foot in the door with the World Economic Forum, right? Because Klaus Schwab. <laughs> why? Because Klaus Schwab also comes from old European money. He represents the Club of Rome, old European money, not, he doesn't represent, you know, uh, Jean Le Boucherie, right? <laughs> I mean, he's, so, so again, I mean, just, just to understand, and I think, again, the context is important. And some of these, and uh, why? Because a lot of what the Second Vatican Council is trying to think about <clears throat> and is how do we deal with how do we commu and this is this is like, I think part of the real like what's the real teaching coming out of the Second Vatican Council and this is why he speaks about the confession and the sacraments and whatnot is how do we really get the sacraments to people in a way that they can understand them so <clears throat> so anyway we have to we have to figure we have to reflect on the Second Vatican Council. Oh, anyway, so, sorry, just real quick. So the image is, so, who, who, like, you could, it would be interesting to write a play someday, right? Or, or a novel where you're basically saying, who were, you know, you put all the people, you put all the characters in, this, in the same appetizer in Rome, right? Who, 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 who now, 40 years later, like Hans Kung, Ratzinger, Robert Blair Kaiser, John Courtney Murray, right? All these, all these characters, right? They would all be characters, or someone like them would be characters in the novel. <clears throat> and so what is, the, what is the result of the council? How was it received? Was the council good or was it inadequate or mistaken? What remains to be done? <clears throat> and then he uses the image, right? he says, well, sometimes when I think about the council, I think of what St. Basil the great doctor of the church, made of the church's situation after the Council of Nicaea, right? And I'm just going to quote now from Basil. The raucous shouting of those who through disagreement rise up against one another, the incomprehensible chatter, the confused din of uninterrupted clamoring has now filled almost the whole of the church, falsifying through excess or failure the right doctrine of the faith. But, so, sorry to interrupt you there for a moment, but don't you think there's a slight irony to that comparison, considering after, you know, in this Arian controversy, you have the Episcopal class, by and large, Arian. Yeah. The rabble, by and large, Nicene. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and so... <laughs> yeah. No, no, there, there, I think, well, I think, again, this is, I think, where he's trying to communicate this message mm -hmm. without saying it directly, <clears throat> right? Mm -hmm. That, that... A lot of the a lot of the ferment after the Second Vatican Council, it's really not the people rising up. It's mm -hmm. not the people of God rising up. Mm -hmm. It's Rousseauian leaders, right? Because one of the th I, I, I was just listening. I, I think one of the things that like again going back to now to the French Revolution, a lot there were a lot of thinkers. You know, Napoleon tries to implement the Napoleonic system. There's a kind of rebellion against the Napoleonic system in the 1820s. In some places, there's an, issue, there's an initial, we love the English system, but then they, they embrace the English system for a few years and everything goes haywire, right? And then there's, uh, on the other hand, then there's also a sense of, well, the problem with the Napoleonic system is that it really didn't implement Rousseau enough, <laughs> right? Rousseauvian naturalism. And of course, part of Rousseau, Rousseau claims that he's the great leader of the people, but everywhere he moves, people hate him. <laughs> <laughs> right? The and, and they drive him out. You know, like, he, there's this one time he moves to, down into, into uh, Switzerland, and they basically, after like a couple years, they so hate him, they like drive him out with sticks and stones, right, to get him out of there. Because naturalism, I mean, naturalism always starts off great, right? It's always like there's this always initial like, yeah, let's all just be natural. But it always ends, it always ends in a fight. 
right? But then the other thing is it also, even Rousseau, even Rousseau admits this in the, in the social contract, right? Eventually, the great, the great legislator, he has to suppress all the laws. And he has to suppress the will of the people, and he becomes the one who intuits the will of the people, right? He knows better than the people what the people will. And this is, I think, part of what's going on in certain promoters of the synod on synodality, right? No, because there's always, there's always, the, there's always the, the, the Rousseauvian who wants to resort to some sort of naturalism. We don't need to change nature. We just need to let it express itself, right? Which, which is so antithetical to Christianity, right? <clears throat> but, the, but then the Rousseauvian becomes like the great leader who interprets what, what nature means, what the natural expression of nature is, and what are the appropriate laws to give it expression. And so I think he's, I think he is kind of saying a little bit here that, yeah, you, in a different way, obviously a little bit different than the Arians, but, but yeah, that it's the people I'm talking to. There's some among you who are the ones who have raised up the storm. And again, I think we might speak about this more next time too, but that certainly it's going to be these, some of these characters who are a little more naturalist in their approach to theology. They're going to be the ones that drive them out. Father, yeah. How do you um, interpret the point here through excess or failure in the context of the, uh, of the council? Right. Rather than just the rackus mobs in the actual historical context. Right. It sounds very much like excesses of the concilium journal. The failure is the neotomists sort of continuing. Well, no, I would the say the failure. Well, I would say the failure would be the failure to. So the excess would be those who just want to go by the council, what he will eventually call the council of the media or the spirit of the council. I think the failure will be <clears throat> the failure will be those who basically don't don't see the need for the shift in emphasis, right? Which which we're going to go, which I think is another thing he'll go into in so many of his writings, right? But I think there's actually three positions here, right? One one is going to be the spirit of the council. The concilium job. Yeah, the other will be <clears throat> the other will be the failure to implement it in the sense of in the sense of well just rejecting it wholesale. But then there, there's also there's another possibility too of what what is prudence? Prudence is understanding your circumstances and applying the principles to those circumstances. But so, I so so another difficulty could just be a failure to fully understand the circumstances. So I, I just have a question here. It, it comes basically a little bit due to the intervention of my honorable friend. I mean, <laughs> it's all good and well to start out by just making repeated attacks on the Concilium Journal and the Neo-Thomism. But if you, read the, if you read the other big journal that, that came out of the Second Vatican Council, you know, the, then what you see is precisely this kind of lofty theology, which is very interesting for the elites to practice, but which the normal, which a normal person can't even understand. Right. And so I have a serious question about whether it's productive to continue bashing specific sectors while leaving aside, you know, sort of, sort of the fact that. So I, I think this is where, this is where, uh, you know, when you're, this is where I think it's it's interesting that it's very. I think when <clears throat> when you're trying to give a an emph new emphasis to principles, are you doing so based on categories of the mind or categories of reality, mm -hmm. right? And <clears throat> so, I think that I think what he's trying to get, what he's going to be getting at in this book, in this draft or in this uh, address is that, well, let's just go through the address, right? Let's just go through the address and, and see if we can start, start to spell this out. So we don't want to apply this dramatic description to the situation of the post-conciliar period, right? So he's saying, first of all, he, so it's interesting here too, right? That in a way it was kind of stormy, <laughs> right? But he doesn't, again, he, but part of statesmanship is that you do want to try to calm down the passions, right? You want to calm down the excesses. So, 
Yes, something occurred, is, yet that something from all that occurred is nevertheless reflected in it. Why has the implementation of the council in large parts of the church thus far been so difficult? And he says, it depends on the correct interpretation of the council, on its proper hermeneutics, the, key to its, the correct key to its interpretation and application. The problems in its implementation arose from the fact that two contrary hermeneutics came face to face and quarreled with each other. One caused confusion, the other silently but more and more visibly bore and is bearing fruit. And so uh, he says, on the one hand, there is an interpretation that I would call the hermeneutic of discontinuity and rupture. <clears throat> it has frequently availed itself of the sympathies of the mass media and also one trend of modern theology. So this, I think he said, this I think he would ascribe to Time Magazine, but, and especially the movements that came out of the Second Vatican Council, which, you know, I, I, like when I, and, I, and I, think you, I think you can say that, well, clearly the media, the media makes much broader or much more widely so it's interesting, the whole, the whole, again, going back to the 1820s and 1830s, the whole science of the mass media develops in the 1820s and the 1830s. Why? Because the liberals realize if we're gonna, if we're gonna, get, if we're gonna get a democratic vote for our way of being, we need like a, then the, the word, the term they would use was breakthrough moment, right? We need a breakthrough moment. We need to use some sort of science of mass communication in order to at least for some time get everybody thinking the way we want them to think for a vote, right? And so the whole, the whole origin of like, how do you get the mass of people to think a certain way? And they, and they explored all sorts of things like what colors do you use? What kind of flags do you have? Uh, I mean, not only journals, songs, in France in the 19th century, there were these singing clubs. And so they, they explored, like, how do you write lyrics to songs that will promote a certain liberal understanding of things so that people will vote the right way? I mean, I mean the Aryans did the same thing, right? They were very good at composing music to try to promote Aryanism. So, so obviously, in, in, the, in the 1950s and 60s, he's, he's also... He's saying the mass media, and I would also say that, like from my own research, that you go, you get very specific to Henry Luce and John Courtney Murray, right? And this this will come down on the document on religious freedom, the document on how to deal with other religions. Henry Luce decided in the late 1940s that John Courtney Murray was his man for trying to influence Catholic doctrine. And, but also, John, uh, Henry Luce realized at some point, from his standpoint, the Catholic Church was not a, the mystical body of Christ. From, from Henry Luce's standpoint, the Catholic Church is an organ of mass communication. And Henry Luce thought, if I could get the Catholic Church to articulate the American proposition. And he, he gave a speech in Rome. He started a university in Rome. Right, called Pro Deo University. And he thought that this university would be his mechanism for expanding the American proposition. Right? So he thought, so Henry Luce and Time Magazine, they saw the church as a vehicle for expressing their ideals, the, the ideas of the American proposition. Right? When I, was, when I was in Rome in 2014 and I went to the Vatican World Economic Forum Conference, which was held in the Vatican, right? And one of the, one of the Austrians who was there, he was a good guy. I forget, I'm, I'm blanking on his name right now, though. He was, he was in the leadership of the Austrian scouts. Uh, but he said to me, he said, yeah, one of the reasons that Klaus Schwab is here is that he sees the Vatican as an instrument for communicating his ideas. It's not, not, it's not much more than that. It's just kind of practical, right? It's, it's not supernatural, but it's, I mean, obviously, right? Uh, Henry Luce writes memos about this, where he says, look, if you can get in, and if you can, the church through its diocesan structures, its parishes, 
right? It has all, this, all these main ways of getting ideas into people's heads. If we could tap into that structure, wow, right? That would be, that would be awesome. I mean, as far as it's a communication structure. So there's always been this fascination among people like Henry Lewis with that. So what does he do? He incorporates John Courtney Murray into, he puts him on the cover of Time Magazine. He, he makes him a cause celeb through Time Magazine. And he also uses Time to trash any opponents or any critics of John Courtney Murray, mm. right? And so by the time you get to the Second Vatican Council, Murray is like the hero and actually, in the end, Murray felt Murray himself was frustrated by the documents that came out of the council, right? To such a degree that he, mistra he mistranslated them because they didn't reflect what he wanted. And he, so he got himself named the first translator of, into English of the documents so he could translate them the way he liked, <laughs> right? <laughs> so the one, the, so, for, so for example, I mean, just to yeah. just get really specific, the one line that's in Dignitatis Humanae, which is that the divine law is the standard of the human law. Murray's first translation leaves that out <laughs> because Murray didn't want that line in the document. Right? He didn't want that line in the document. So, and then when John Paul II comes to the United States in Philadelphia, he, he quotes that line right, to correct Murray mm. and to make sure that Americans know it. Again, that's like another little subtle, like it's very subtle. But, but the point is that, my, my point is that, and, and I think also this example now, like based on what he's going to say eventually, I think this also shows there's a third little position here that is a little amb ambiguous, even in Ratzinger's position. And it's that, I, I'll just say my thesis. I'll just say the thesis. Well, no, so... On the next page, he starts to use French Revolution language in explaining the council, right? The top of the next page. The nature of a council as such is misunderstood. In this way, it is considered a sort of constituent that eliminates an old constitution and creates a new one. That's the French, this is French Revolution, right? However, the constituent assembly needs a mandator and then confirmation by the mandator. In other words, the people the Constitution must serve. The fathers had no such... So he's saying the Second Vatican Council was not a French Revolution. The fathers had no such mandate, and no one ever, and no one had ever given them one, nor could anyone have given them one because the essential Constitution of the Church comes from the Lord and when give, was given to us so that we might attain eternal life. And starting from this perspective, be able to illuminate in time and time itself. So he's saying here that, <clears throat> and then he goes on to say the bishops are the ones that they're the stewards of the mysteries of God. So he's, he's already starting to use the language here of there are some who see the Second Vatican Council as a revolutionary moment, a French revolutionary moment, right? And he says, but in the French revolutionary moment, you have to completely suppress the old order to welcome in a new order. And, and he wants to resist that. And also, it's interesting, right? After the, and, and part of what gives birth to Ratzinger and then eventually the whole romantic movement, it gives birth both to, both to neo-scholasticism and other elements of the romantic movement, is those who are critical of the Napoleonic regime, right? They start to say, well, we have to look further back into our history. We have to, we have to, to see what, what's there, what's, what's in Europe, like De Maestra gives, he's the one that really gives impetus to this. What's back in the history that we have missed, that we need to, again, not, not just to kind of blindly bring it up, to, up into our own time, but how do we, is there some principle or some emphasis of the principles that we've lost that we need to bring back up into our own time and reincarnate in our time. And this, that motion, that romantic motion gives birth to studies in the Fathers of the Church and it gives birth to two movements in Europe in the 19th century. 
One is the renewal of petrology. Another is the renewal of dogmatics as a, as a theological study. And then also it gives birth to neo, neo-Thomism. And so you get the, so between 1820 and 1850, just to give a brief history here, between 1820 and 1850, it's kind of a wild time in the church, theologically speaking. There's, there's no neo-Thomism yet, really, in any kind of official circles. Everybody's exploring all different possibilities, including the, the new Rousseauian possibilities, right, following Lamine, including, including also a kind of neo-Thomism, a kind of neo-scholasticism, including a kind of neo-patrology, following the fathers of the church. So in the 18, by the 1850s, especially after the revolution of 1848, the advisors to Blessed Pius IX, they basically say, well, maybe we should start like limiting the field a little bit, defining what the field is like, you know, defining the playground. And, that, and then also they began saying, well, also, maybe also, right, rather than first becoming experts in some modern area, area of life, like Kantianism or Rousseauvianism, especially our seminarians, should first become Thomas. And then from the lens of St. Thomas, they can then use that for studying various modern movements to see what's good, what's bad, and what could be done better, right? <clears throat> and so that movement between, let's say, 1850 and 1950 becomes what we now call neo-scholasticism. In the United States, neo-scholasticism isn't, they don't even start to implement it. So Attorney Patris would be the great document of neo-scholasticism, which is what, 18, I forget the year now, Leo XIII, we could look it up, late 19th century, right? But Attorney Patris doesn't really start to get implemented in the United States until the 1920s. So really from the 1920s until the 1950s in the US, you really just get the first iteration of an attempt to teach neo-scholasticism. And so that's, that's what people will all, will all criticize as the manual tradition. But also, be, again, beginning with, beginning, in the, beginning in, the, in the 20th century, you have a whole new iteration, 79? Yeah, I, I didn't want to say it, but that's what I thought it was. But <laughs> So, but, but also, right, Beginning in, beginning in the late 19th, early 20th century, you get a whole new iteration of evolutionary biology, the Darwinian school, right? You, you get the whole, all these developments in the late 19th, early 20th century, developments or hypotheses, especially in the field of biblical criticism. Uh, some true, some false, right? So <clears throat> then... In the early 20th century, you get blessed, you get now Saint Pius X, who, in, who institutes the oath against modernism as a way of, and then within this, you get some characters like Tehar de Chardin. I mean, Tehar de Chardin, in the, early, in the early 20th century, he starts to develop a whole theology of evolution, where, the, where this is very pantheistic, like the whole universe is evolving <laughs> towards Christ, to become Christ. Right. And so he gets silenced. Right. And a lot of people that follow him get silenced. And by the 1950s, Pius XII, he for some time silences John Courtney Murray, the American church state theologian, political actor. Whatever, you might want to call him different things. But uh, <laughs> but then there's other there's others also get the silence because then there's others who get silenced like Henri de Lubac. They're trying to work out, they're trying to work out a kind of, again, both in the 19th century and the 20th century, there are these tendencies of, well, can we use new, can we use new ways of, can we use the fathers of the church? Are there new ways of thinking about society? Have the social sciences give us, given us developments that we can use to further our way of explaining scripture? And... You, and a great example of this, you can see with these first 10 points of Space Salvi, right? They're a great example of, I think, the Pope himself doing what he thought would be the, the healthy 
expansion of theology let's say comes about as a result of the second vatican council so for example he says when we're talking about hope right we need to make a distinction between performative right the, the performative and the oh now i'm blanking on it uh uh, the, uh, I'm blanking on the terminology, but he uses terms from from uh, deconstructionism, right? Right. To, to basically say is hope per, hope should be both something that's that's thought, but also acted on. And I'm, I'm just blanking on the other word at this moment. But the other thing he does, right? The other thing he does in the beginning of Space Salvi is he ignite, he goes into like an in depth analysis of the language of hope, accounting for all the biblical criticism that's been done into what hope means, right? In the book of Hebrews, in the, in the letter to the Hebrews. <clears throat> and, and, and he even then critiques early 20th century German biblical criticism as being not exactly giving us the right, right? So in other words, he says, hope is the substance of things not seen. Well, that word substance goes back to the Middle Ages he explains how St. Thomas interprets the word substance. He then shows how the German school said substance means conviction, right? But that that's erroneous. It can't quite mean conviction. And I think part of what he's getting, so I think part of what he's getting at there is that, again, the, the neo-scholastic, the manuals of the, of the 1950s, one problem with them pedagogically is that they were, they were first efforts, so they, 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 they were good at like maintaining the principle, but they weren't very good at like putting that principle in a context of like, how does this principle meet the challenges of modern philosophy? How does it draw on? Is there a continuity between scripture, the fathers, and the principle that the manual articulates? And then also, how does it kind of deal with contemporary circumstances? Right? Those are all, for all the good, that, and actually I, I can find even now as a teacher, like sometimes I go back to the manuals because in all the morass that we find ourselves in, at some point it's healthy, it's kind of encouraging, just like, okay, what's a statement of the principles, right? And then I'll figure out all the rest, right? In fact, it's, so the same professor that I was telling you about earlier, one of my students went to her once and said, hey, you know, the manuals are really good, at least as far as like giving us the principles. And I think someone at some point should write an article on, right, the value of the manuals, right? And then she said, that's a great, she said, that's a great idea. Someone like you needs to write that paper, <laughs> but wait till you get tenure, right? Don't write that paper until you get tenure. <laughs> but anyway, so... I think, I think the authentic, I think what, what, let's say, if we go to November 1962 and what he's going to speak about in this address to the Roman Curia and what he thinks he's having Frings do in 1962, I think what he's trying to say is the Ottaviani outlines, they're good, right? And that didn't quite come across in 1962 and it still is not, you know, they're good because they preserve the principles. But... They're limited in the sense that there, there's, we have to show how we're rooted in Scripture, clearly. We have, to, we have to show how we're rooted in the fathers of the church. We have to allow for, we have to genuinely allow for insights that could come from the social sciences, the modern, modern developments in the social sciences and philosophy and whatnot. We have to kind of show that. And, and we have to do it. We have to actually do it as good. And then also we have to meet people where they are. Like now the question is, who are the people, right? No, but so, so I, think that's, I think that's the dynamic he's trying to go after. Now, I'll also say like in, in Space Salvi, <clears throat> he gives us Bakita, right? The story of Bakita. Well, there's a few things he leaves out of the story. There's a few things that he leaves out of the story of Bakita, that I think are also, this is where like, I'd like to say now, there's also a kind of, so I was talking with another theologian last summer who's a, I think one of the best theologians alive right now. And we were talking about Pope Ratzinger and his whole contribution to theology of the 20th century. 
And this guy, yeah, said to me, yeah, I mean, look, let's face it. Like, who are the who are the great towering figures of theology of the 20th century? It's it's uh, Guardini, Garrigou Lagrange, and Ratzinger. And in a way, so what we were talking about is that they need each other, right? That sometimes Ratzinger is so subtle that you lose sight of the principles. And you kind of wonder, is what he giving you a principle or a category of his mind, hmm. right? In the end, <clears throat> right? So sometimes he's so subtle, and especially when he's reflecting on his life, that you kind of wonder, and like, and again, because, well, he's involved in a revolutionary moment in 1962 with Frings. And whether he knew it, did he know it or not, that there were these appetizers going on with Robert Blair Kaiser and Henry Luce and John Courtney Murray, and that they were conspiring, right, to, they were breathing together in the same room, right, to use the, use the Second Vatican Council to influence the life of the church. And they controlled the media. And it's, and then, so then what's interesting though is, and the reason I bring this up is precisely because while he points out problems, <clears throat> so, so, so if you go to the next page, the paragraph that begins in the 19th century under Pius IX. So the, the, the theologian I was talking to last summer, he was saying, look, in the end, Ratzinger needs the, the scholastic foundation, right? Because the scholastic foundation, what it really is good at is articulating the principles, right? So without that, you could a little bit be kind of like a, like a boat lost at sea in the stormy waters, going back to our basal analogy. Right, so in the 19th century under Pius IX, oh, sorry, I, I want to say one more thing about Paquita. When he tells the story of Paquita, her life, there's a few things he leaves out, which she or her, I mean, it's not that, it wouldn't be that hard for him to know these things. Number one, why, first of all, who was her owner? The first name of her Italian owner that bought, like he just says, oh, the Italian, like the Italians bought, got, bought her from Sudan. And, and the, the, the sense is like, and I remember when I first read it, I was like, oh, these good, you know, these good, like t Italians, they must have some like, you know, Catholic spirit in them. Well, the, the name of her owner was Illuminati Michelis. <laughs> <laughs> Can you guess what side of the cultural battles of the 19th century he was on, right? <laughs> so he, he buys her in the Sudan. And in both, you know, by, by the time he buys her in the Sudan in the 1880s, slavery is illegal both in Italy and in England. Right? So even the, even, the, even the countries that are warring over control of the Sudan, and there's a whole other issue of colonialism and whatnot, but like almost everyone involved is not, and their legal system prohibits slavery. And so who, Illuminati thinks he's, he, he's so illuminated, right, that he can buy a slave. <laughs> so then he brings her, and I, I, mean, I laugh, but so then he brings her to, he brings her to Venice and of course, his wife, it's like the classic, it's like the classic liberal who's married a Catholic. His wife is a good, pious Italian lady. And so she introduces him to these Kenosian sisters who start teaching her the faith. But they also teach her Italian law. And so Illuminati wants to bring her back to Sudan at some point. And the Kenosian sisters, it's like, it's not clear, like, is he bringing her back to the Sudan to sell her in a slave market? or just because she's a good servant. And so the, the, the basically, again, I don't, know, I, don't know, I don't know all the specifics, but she eventually sues, right? In other words, somebody taught her Italian law so that she could sue in a court of law to stay in Venice and not have to go back to the Sudan. And that's how she gains her freedom, based on principle, right? And so then that's how then she then becomes... Come, come, they, they then she stays in Venice. They teach her the faith, and then who baptizes her and confirms her? The future Saint Pius X, right? He was the cardinal patriarch of Venice at the time. Which he doesn't say it in that. So this is another like subtle, 
There's like a subtle message that he's sending, an indirect message he's sending in the encyclical too. And maybe he, maybe he's not even fully aware of the message that he's sending, right? But we don't want to un. In other words, we have to. I mean, <clears throat> without undoing, how do we preserve the prince? So, so he'll say here. He'll say here, Pius the Ninth, and you also say Pius the Tenth, Pius the Eleventh, Pius. All the Piuses are included here in Pius the Ninth. The clash between the church's faith and a radical liberalism in the natural sciences, which also claim to embrace with their knowledge the whole of reality to its limit. Stubbornly proposing to make the hypothesis, so here's this word, hypothesis, antithesis, antithesis, synthesis is coming out again. Superfluous, had elicited from the church, so in other words, science was all was all explaining in the 19th century, especially liberal scientists like Darwin, right? They could explain everything. They were very atheistic. And I think in his mind, in Ratzinger's mind, we were saying this last time, right? That for Ratzinger, Heisenberg, Heisenberg, Heisenberg was huge because Heisenberg admitted, he, he brought science to the limits of science. And he once again admitted that if we're going to really understand physics, we need to admit that there's form and matter. It's like he's the new Anaxagoras, right? <laughs> right? And I think for Ratzinger, and, and so for, for, for Ratzinger, he says this in the Seawall biography that Heisenberg was huge for him because it, it, it helped us to see once again that we could be in dialogue with science after the Second World War. Just as we could once, and, and there's also this great hope that after the Second World War, we could be in dialogue with Americans and Europeans. The, you know, Charles de Gaulle, Adenauer, Schumann, is it, was it Schumann? Schumann? Robert Schumann. Yeah. Robert Schumann. Like these, we, uh, the, 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 the ones in Italy, Fanfani in Italy, right? We could be in dialogue with all these guys. Cal and then actually, so through Jacques Maritain, Roberto Calvi was like the great white hope. Can I ask you about this yeah. a little bit? Just um, <clears throat> so, if look on the on the next page, there's this passage in the paragraph that starts. It is precisely in this combination of continuity and discontinuity at different levels. And then he says, um, in this process of innovation and continuity, we must learn to understand more practically than before that the church's decisions on contingent matters. For example, certain practical forms of liberalism should necessarily be contingent themselves precisely because they refer to a specific reality that is changeable. And then he goes on, um, not so permanent are the practical forms that depend on the historical situation and are therefore subject to change. Right, 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 right. So, I mean, it seems to me that uh, Benedict himself seems to have assumed, and I, and I think Ignatius Humana assumes this, that what Benedict says on the previous page is that Catholic statesmen have demonstrated that a modern secular state could exist that was not neutral regarding values, but alive, drawing from the great ethical sources opened by Christianity. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. also uh, that um, the American Revolution offers a model of a kind of moderate liberalism. Yeah, that, yeah, that was, yeah. In contradistinction to the radical liberalism of the French Revolution. Right. Those are the two empirical assumptions underlying Benedict's kind of moderate liberalism. Right. But I think... But I think he'd be the first to say that if those are disproven by fact. Yeah, so it's interesting. Yeah. I, I just read a letter that he wrote yeah. in October of last year. Someone just showed me a letter that he wrote to the president of Steubenville yeah. in, uh, in October of last year. And I, I haven't read the, I, I haven't seen the letter that the president of Steubenville wrote to him. Yeah. But it was on this question is what is the church and what is the church in relation to the state? Yeah. And he, it's, it's, in, it's really, so this, this person asked me to read this letter line by line with him. And in reading it line by line with him, it kind of, what kind of became clear to me is that without directly saying it, he backed off from these statements, mm -hmm. saying that clearly what's going to have to be maintained is the principle that the church has an authority. 
and that the state also has an authority, and that agreements have to be made between them. And that these practical arrangements are based on categories of the mind, exactly. not yeah. principles, and they may not be lasting. Is this published anywhere? I don't think so, not yet. Maybe it'll be in this posthumous writings book that's okay. coming out. Yeah. But I'm, I, like I told the guy that showed it to me, yeah. Can you get me the president's letter? Because <laughs> I just want to see it, yeah. right? But I think also this is the so this is why I bring up the appetizers at the Second Vatican Council and John <laughs> Courtney Murray. But it, it's interesting that here. So this is where, like, again, I, I'm saying this in what is a little bit of a closed group, yeah. right? So I don't mean it as a. But there's a little bit of an ambiguity in his using the American Revolution as the model, mm, right? Right, because precisely at the Second Vatican Council, it was the Americans who were trying to influence the council. And, inf and also he, his whole life, has been influenced by the Americans in ways that he himself may not even have fully realized. No, I agree. I was just thinking more of Adenauer and the idea, the fundamental empirical presumption, as it seems to me, is this post-war yeah. <clears throat> European well, that, all that also. democracy that... Yeah, you know, is is tolerant of other religions, but is sort of <clears throat> pro-Christian in some sense. Right, and if that simply disappears or becomes affirmatively hostile to Catholicism, right, then the whole empirical foundation for a lot of the Second Council disappears. Right. Yeah. No. This, this, so I think yeah. this is one of the areas where, I mean, I was thinking, even though it's very contemporary, I think it's also pregnant that this this week when they asked the German minister about whether the Americans blew up the pipeline. After, yeah. after Seymour Hersh's article came yeah. out, the German minister said, well, the Americans told us that they had nothing to do with it. But in other words, sorry, right, the, the point here just being that, that there's a way in which it seems like many of the European leaders at the time, they were following a kind of Maritanian, like yeah. as, far, as far as church-state relations, they were very much enamored with some sort of Maritanian liberal Puritan uh, pluralism, liberal pluralism, right? Which was not it was it was it was it's not clear how much it was based in principle, as it was based just in the good nature, the good willed. I mean, Maritain himself said, "Why am I participating in the in the in writing the document in the UN on human rights?" Well, because I just. I'm assuming the goodwill of these people and that over time, goodwill will prevail. <laughs> right? <laughs> for, 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 just as a follow-up. Yeah. Um, if it is proven, as the learned professor has said, that the um, empirical foundations for a document like the Nittati Sumani are somehow proven false, if it can be seen as such, does that require a reinterpretation of the entire Sumani to fit a more no. Catholic. Well, what I would lens say, what I would say to that is that altogether. what I would say that every every document of the Church, almost every document of the Church, if you learn how to read, uh, Gilson says this in the book I was referring to earlier. Gilson says this: every document of the Church, even a document from a council, or even an encyclical, you have to know how to read the different parts of it, right? So there are some parts where it will clearly articulate the principles. There are other parts where it'll say, well, we're trying to apply those principles to circumstances, right? So, <clears throat> and in the history of the church, how do you interpret councils? You interpret councils wherever there's ambiguity or, or a lack of clarity in the council, you go back to previous councils, the fathers that you go back to the scripture, the fathers of the church and previous councils in order to iron out the difficulty. So I would, my approach, you'll do what you want in your own careers, but my approach that I would recommend would be if it's, if it's shown that, and I, and I, and I, think, I think there's several paths you could take to show the problems or at least the ambiguities. I've suggested one, the other one would be just the European arrangements. Uh, so if you can show that that's there, well, then, you, then basically this is ambiguous. The principle of the, the divine law, the, so the, what's the real principle? The divine law is the standard of the, like, so Monsignor Fenton, 
Monsignor Fenton, who was a kind of opponent of John Courtney Murray, he, he was also a paratus on, this, on the commission that put together this document. It's really interesting to read his correspondence because the, it's like this in the, in the, it was like in the last draft or the second to last draft that the line, the divine law is the standard of the human law, gets put into the document. So before that point, it's not there. And, 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 so, and so once the line gets put in, Fenton writes home to his people back home and he says, we've been saved, right? You know, he said, there's all, sort, there's all sorts of confusing statements, there's all sorts of ambiguity in the document, but the principle has been saved. The teaching has been saved. So over time, all the other stuff will be clarified by previous, by previous documents. And Father, if I could just uh, quote from Dignitatis Humanae here, it, it, it does very clearly say, like, therefore, it, being religious liberty, leaves untouched traditional Catholic doctrine right. on the moral duty of men in societies towards the true religion and towards the one church of Christ. Yeah. And also, if in view of per peculiar circumstances obtaining among peoples, special civil recognition is given to one religious community in the constitutional order of society, it is the same time imperative that the right of all citizens and religious communities to religious freedom should be recognized and um, yeah. made yeah. effective in practice. So, yeah, so the if, principle is there. Precisely. And if, if I'm correct, um, you know, Professor, you were referring to the, the, the document at hand here uh, with respect to the fact, you know, Benedict's understanding of the American project with respect to the, um, the French Revolution. Um, if that, if, if what the sort of two poles he's setting up could be proven empirically false, i.e. that they might have the same underlying, uh, you know, principles that we could rework, um, you know, some of the conclusions. They are both here. revolutions. Yeah, right. But <laughs> just as a matter of clarification, yeah. were you referring to Dignitatis Humanae or the document at but, hand but here? Both. I mean, so did, look, every, correct me, Father, if this yeah. is the right way to think about it, but every, every document of the Second Council has a has a contingent component and a principal component. This is Benedict's hermeneutic. And if the contingent component changes or is disproven, then the principal component will yield different implications in the new right. circumstances. So no one's arguing for jettisoning the document or anything. Else. Right. But it's just that the principle that yields X in condition A may yield not X in condition B, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. And and I think Benedict would be the first to say that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not. I, I wasn't yeah, suggesting yeah. that it was a yeah, suggestion yeah. of the line of professor. Yeah. The, the question that I had more was father that one of the great criticisms of the council uh, from you know those that don't accept parts of it is precisely that there's no clear canon. There's no clear place where it says this is a principle, this is not. So a, a plain sense reading, this is, I think, at the heart of a dispute I've been having with some friends, is that when you read Dignitatis Sumani, I read right to religion, right to the freedom of religion, as being a principle, whereas somebody else might very well read the document and say that's a contingency, because right. it's to do with the contingency. It's a practical, practical, it's a practical, practical. arrangement. So the, the criticism of the council, I think, how do you respond to... Um, those that say there aren't any canons, or how do you know precisely what the principles of the council are, given that there aren't any indications, like in Trent, for example, or right. Vatican I? Right. Well, this is where this is where the magisterium over time will have to will have to articulate it, right? And 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 the magisterium, at least the way that historically the way the magisterium works is by you go to previous principles. And those are your guides for determining what the principle is in the document that, that that expresses continuity with the previous ones. And so that would be that would be precisely sort of the problem at hand here from my perspective. I mean, if you've got the magisterium of the church previously, you know, direct, direct directly contra setting up a principle that appears to go in opposition to something that was later said in Vatican II, then it seems most reasonable to take that, that sort of statement by Vatican II precisely as contingent on current circumstances, yeah. because it seems silly that Vatican II would set up a principle that directly contradicts the previous principle. While, as you said, it's very possible for Vatican II to set up a contingent statement that 
you know, sort of interacts with a previous principle in a way that might not have been expected. Right. Right. I think relationship with the Jewish people is another area mm -hmm. where this, this, this manifests itself. Mm -hmm. Because <clears throat> the church never wants to, does, the church will never say that, it can't say that Jewish people should not convert. Mm -hmm. Right? But one thing that does come out of the Second Vatican Council is the church shuts down the office of, should we have an office for missionary activity to Jewish people? Mm -hmm. Right? That doesn't mean that the church is saying, and I think some people who are critical will say, well, maybe the church is just giving up on the Jews. But that's not the case, right? It's, it's just the case is we're not going to have a specific office for... And then within that being outlined, there's, there's also a, an attempt to say, well, how, how do we approach... I mean, there's been a whole... This is another area of... of <laughs> the whole thing of interreligious dialogue, right? How do we approach dialogue with all the other religions mm -hmm. while still acknowledging the truth, but then also... Uh, maybe not leading with a combative chin, mm -hmm. right? Uh, not, uh, not combative from mm -hmm. sword, but just an argumentative chin, right? So how do we, how do we, uh, and so like in the, in the 1990s, I, I don't know, there were at least a hundred apologies, right, that the, that the Pope carried out to all the, you know, we're, we apologize, there were all these leading up to the year 2000. It was, it was always, this was always one of the, like interreligious this, so an apology to the Hussites, an apology to the evangelicals, an apology to the Dutch, an apology to the Jews. Like there were all these ap apologies to the Orth Russian Orthodox, to the Montenegrin Orthodox. I mean, there were all these, no, there, no, literally there was like apology after apology after apology because the church was trying to follow the second, the, what they thought was in the Second Vatican Council, which was that with all religions, we want to basically start more from the standpoint of there's going to be some seed of the gospel that's there and you know good just good traditional even medieval pedagogy mm -hmm. was yeah. you meet them where they are you draw them where you want them mm -hmm. to be yeah. right so how can we almost bend over backwards mm -hmm. i mean given given his given history and given the images that can be in like i remember when i was in notre dame we hired this one fellow who grew up in a secular jewish family and then the first seminar he participated in where we were going to talk about faith and reason like he came to me before the seminar and he was red and sweating because he was just in fear. I mean, he was, he was, he was, in, he had never been involved with Catholics in a discussion of faith and reason. And just based on things he had heard as a child growing up, mm -hmm. he was just in, even, even though he was no longer even a practicing Jew, mm -hmm. he was in an absolute panic about what might happen at this seminar. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, he was really happy. He was like, wow, like, it's one of the best discussions of my life. People are so nice, you know. But I, but I think that's, I think that's, I, you know, in other words, he was, what he was, he, there was just all this historical baggage, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And so I think part of, I think the, I think part of what the church was trying to do since the Second Vatican Council is to, assure, like, bend over backwards mm -hmm. just to assure any group that's out there, like, mm -hmm. we're, we're not here to scare you. I mean, Hellfire might scare you eventually, but that's but we don't want we're not but 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 we're not here to scare you, right? Yeah. At least in, in the way we we're you know to fear like you know doing damage to you in some sense, mm -hmm. right? And so, and so that's why I think why there were all these apologies. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's the good explanation of why there were all yeah. these apologies in the 1990s. But then there's this other question then of, well, how do you then deal with contingencies that subsequently arrive arise? Mm -hmm. And, I, and so my hope next time, actually, since we're getting near the end here, I want to deal with Regensburg, what comes out of Regensburg, the whole problem of synodality, uh, that these are all, again, issues that are where the tensions, and he even says it in this dialogue, in this uh, address, he says, certainly we're not going to stop having these tensions, mm -hmm. right? We have to deal with them.